Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm James Hooper, uh, COO for Development Beyond Learning, uh, and welcome to our latest industry engagement session uh, on the well-being gender gap in the hybrid future of work. Uh, for those who've been to our events before, welcome back. Uh, and for those who are joining us for the first time, uh, we run these workshops quarterly uh, in Australia, the UK, and Singapore to share information uh, with our industry partners and contacts on the current trends, shifts, changes and opportunities within the early careers uh, space. Um, and today's session is the last in our series of events on belonging and well-being uh, that have run over the last few quarters. Uh, I'm very pleased today to be joined by and to introduce you to our CEO, Angela Hans, who will be facilitating us today. Hi, Angela, how are you? Very well, thank you, James. Good to be here. Excellent. Uh, and also very pleased to be joined by our guest speaker today, Natasha Van Wick, uh, the Manager of Learning Design at BHP. Hi, Natasha. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thanks so much for joining us, Natasha. Um, so everyone, um, there's a fair few more people to join us throughout the session. Um, please feel comfortable to have your videos on. Please feel comfortable to be a part of the conversation. Um, and also, please do use the chat box uh, as we're moving through the session. If you have any burning questions, uh, we will be monitoring that. It will help other people to know what's being asked. Um, and we will try to stop and address some of those questions uh, along the way. So um, uh, with that in mind, thank you. And I think for time, we will kick off. Um, Angela, I will hand this over to you to uh, take us into the session. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks, James, for the kind introduction. And it's wonderful to be here and to see some familiar faces, but also meet some new faces. Um, I'm always uh, privileged to have an opportunity to facilitate these sessions throughout our regions and in, in, in the world. Um, and today I'm able to do this one, which is fantastic and an area that I'm also equally passionate about. So for those who are familiar or are not, are not familiar with development beyond learning and who we are, we provide human skill development in the future workforce. Uh, we are backed by behavioural science, we have first class trainers and an unparalleled heritage in early talent development. We're a proudly Australian business, but now global, uh, with offices in London, Singapore and Sydney. And um, we're here, we're on a mission to really support the early talent and talent of the future. And we're looking to um, support up to 1 million young people each year by 2025. That's what we're doing there. We're super proud um, and privileged to be recognized by our peers and our colleagues in the industry that we work in globally. Um, just a snapshot of some of that recognition that we do receive from that. And then of course, um, today we are really talking about a, a very important topic that we're all starting to navigate as employers and also start to thinking about when we look at our talent and our future strategy of work coming out of the pandemic and how that's starting to impact our workforce, our um, people and what that's looking at. So today we're going to be focusing on well-being, focusing on the area of gender and how that's starting to unravel and play out over the past few years and then moving into the future. So we'll share some research and data um, that will help to really put context to why this is an important subject matter. I've also, uh, as James has kindly introduced, love to invite Natasha to join me and share her on the ground insights, her observations and thoughts about what she's seeing and what she, um, what she is able to to share with us from that perspective. Uh, we'd also like to make sure that you walk away with some strategies, thinking about how we can support well-being, particularly when we look at a well-being group like the gender gap. And then of course, where we have time, we'll do questions and answers. Of course, as James mentioned, if you do have questions, or even if you'd like to share any stories or comments of what you're doing in your own organizations, please feel free to do so and share that on chat. Uh, everyone would love to, we use these events as a, a way to connect and to collaborate and to share with each other. It's a safe space. And of course, where I can, I'll let James also invite any of those questions to come forward. So let's get started, the research. So when we, uh, first of all, why does well-being matter? And not just for women, but for everyone. And how does supporting workforce well-being support the bottom line? We know that high levels of well-being are positively correlated with the human and business measures that we want to see increase and negatively correlated with those that we would wish to see decrease. 
As with diversity and inclusion, the business case for supporting well-being is the definition of a no-brainer. It improves organizational and individual performance and health. And with positive well-being, it's also very highly correlated with positive experience of belonging and how people are feeling belonged in their communities or in their groups, such as the companies that they work for. We know that organizations that deliberately support their employees in both these areas will, will rightly reap the rewards. There's a great quote from Gallup out of a 2021 survey that they did where they quoted successful corporations of the future not only will generate profits, but also will generate thriving employees who are capable of weathering crises. So why is this important for us and particularly important when we look at our employees based here in Australia? We did some research and got gathered some data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics and Gallup reported that we've got uh, a statistic of 15% of Australians report increased loneliness that they've been feeling over the past few years and coming out of the pandemic. There's an experience of high or very high psychologically, psychological distress at 15%. And we're seeing a rise for people between the ages of 16 to 34, where they're feeling that, that pressure and, and lack of well-being um, rise from one in five. 45% of Australian employees report daily stress coming into the everyday world, and we've got employee engagement at 20%, which is a concerning factor when we start to think about what does that look like for individuals and how do we help them uh, thrive and feel well in their day-to-day. -day. So there's never been a more pertinent time to talk about well-being than it is right now. To better understand the well-being of the workforce globally and to understand how organisations could best support and sustain their people, people's well-being as the world navigates its way out of the pandemic and into the future, my team at DBL commissioned research incorporating hundreds of hours of desk research and surveying over 1,000 senior executives, uh, talent, HR, L&D leaders, early career employees, students, and established talent across the UK, Australia, and Southeast Asia. We conducted this research between August 2020 and May of 2021, and the results culminated in a white paper that is available free for all of you to download in full from our website. And today we'll share some of those key insights as long as some latest reports and data that we're getting as well. Just for those who are, who are interested in the research uh, methodology, we uh, sought to measure well-being on drawing on three main techniques, the evaluation approach, the eudaimonic approach, and the experience approach. And we did that in partnership of the London School of Economics and the Office for National Statistics that helped us with that. So when we looked at the well-being and trying to identify, well, what was the significant well-being gaps that are starting to be uh, of concern and, and needing attention when we look at our workplace and our future workforce environments. Our research revealed that the impact of COVID-19 on wellbeing levels has not been democratic. And we all know that, and we've all felt that in different ways, not only for ourselves, but for people in our own, in our own worlds, personally and professionally. There are certain groups particularly vulnerable to be depleted and our findings uncovered three key wellbeing gap groups. The first was the lead versus the leaders where the lead were having increased, um, increased depleted wellbeing uh, of themselves. The second is the women versus the men and the third being early career uh, talent versus your established talent coming in on that. Myriad factors play into these well-being gaps, including levels of autonomy, resource and confidence, as well as importantly, opportunities for connection, and all of which employers will need to navigate as we transition to the hybrid future of work and how we're thinking about different ways that our talent's working. It is important when we look at these global well-being groups that there's also macro groups that can be uncovered within them. For example, we can identify that there might be social inequality playing out in some of these groups in certain regions that you might have operations in and so on and so forth. So by no means does this say it covers everybody, but we can actually drill down into some of these groups depending on your industry and your organizations and start to identify where some of them might be exasperated more by macro elements that apply out in those areas. 
Last year, for those who were able to attend, we held a graduate panel event to deep dive into the wellbeing gap for early career talent and hear directly from the graduates themselves, which was a really fascinating session and one that um, we, have, we have recorded and got some insights from. Should you want to get some information from that, you can, of course, reach out to my colleagues, James and Matt, with that. But today, our focus is going to be on women and the wellbeing gender gap that our research uncovered. So let's get uh, started into the data. Across the entire survey population, a discrepancy between the experienced well-being of men and women was found, such that men were 13% more likely than women to rate their own well-being as good. The UK government has recently concluded from their own Spotlight Research series, which tracks population mental health and well-being during the pandemic, that there is an underlying relationship between gender and the impact of, of COVID-19 on well-being. That came out in November 2021. And what we've also uh, now seen is that that well-being gender gap is corroborated by the Australian Bureau of Statistics in Australia too. So similarities are coming through globally and we're starting to see these trends um, being felt across all regions. The disparity in well-being between men and women are, is also seen at the business leader level, suggesting that seniority does not protect from the impact to well-being felt as a result of gender. Female business leaders were 12% less likely than their male counterparts to report feelings of happiness and 10% less likely to agree they felt satisfied with their life nowadays. And when we look at the exploring the well-being gender gap, the relatively large gap in experienced well-being between men and women, and the fact that this is not mitigated by seniority indicates that something specifically attrib attributable to gender is at play in the COVID context. The Mental Health Foundation study, Mental Health in the Pandemic, reveals that women more likely than men to report being worried about their finances. And perhaps linked to, to this, it is interesting to note that globally, women currently still earn a quarter less than men. They are also more anxious at 19% more, lonely at 9% more, and hopeless due to the pandemic, uh, feelings of the, from the pandemic at 5% more. And that was supported uh, by a Deloitte study uh, and survey of working women across countries, including Australia, UK, China, Japan, and India, revealing that over a quarter reported being less able to prioritize their health and well-being due to the strains put on them by the pandemic. More than half believe their male colleagues were not impacted to the same degree by that pandemic. Now, interestingly, there is an age dynamic to the well-being gender gap, and women generally find to be more likely to experience common mental health problems than men, and rates are on the rise. But this is especially prevalent among young women, which is super interesting and something that we should take note of, with 26% of 16 to 24 year old women diagnosed with symptoms of common disorders such as anxiety or depression, versus just the 9.1% of men aged in the similar age range. And in the workplace, our own research has identified two striking disparities in female wellbeing during the pandemic. That's the perceived capability and the perceived autonomy levels. So when we start to think about what that capability and autonomy level looks, looks like, let's look at some of that data that's starting to share those insights. Our research found a gap between men and women across all respondents in the perception of the quality of their own performance during the pandemic. Men were 14% more likely to believe their performance had improved than women were, which is very interesting. And that could be a contributing factor to also the well-known coined term that we hear now of imposter syndrome. Now, imposter syndrome, for uh, those who may, may not be familiar with it, was a, a first posited by psychologists Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes back in 1978. So it's been around for some time. But the idea of imposter syndrome is that it causes women, despite outstanding academic and professional accomplishments, to persist in believing that they are not really bright and have fooled anyone who thinks otherwise. The likes of Sheryl Sandberg, Michelle Obama, Charlie's Theron, and even the Supreme Court Justice Sota, um, Sonia Sotomayor have all compared, confessed to experiencing imposter syndrome. 
And Lynn Perry Wooten, who's actually an expert in organizational development and transformation, suggests that imposter syndrome could be one of the factors contrib contributing to a she session in which we see women being left behind in the workforce due to the last few years and COVID-19. So over time, imposter syndrome can trigger anxiety disorders, depression, and can lead to burnout. When we looked at some of the data back here in the uh, Asia Australian region, the Asana's Annual Australia Anatomy of Work Index reveals that 54% of workers have suffered from imposter syndrome this year. There is an interesting generational difference occurring with that. The 75% of young generations, that's your Gen Z and millennials, reporting they have suffered from burnout and imposter syndrome versus 56% of your older generations, your Gen X and your baby boomers. And imposter syndrome is more common when facing new challenges or being out of comfort zone because factors such as stress and ambiguity and isolation feed pre-existing self-doubt. And with that, given women are more prone to imposter syndrome and given the pandemic as a context which has helped to exasperate imposter syndrome, it is perhaps unsurprising that we see women displaying less confidence than men through the pandemic. Now, our research also revealed a gender gap and perceived autonomy, which could be could impact the disparity experienced in well-being between men and women. Our research revealed men were 14% more likely than women to believe they had as much or more autonomy at work as before the pandemic. And when we think about autonomy, autonomy is a core psychological need. We talk about this when we look at our behavioral science, when we look at development of our skills, but we also think about it when we look at our workplace strategies and how are we helping people to thrive through feelings of autonomy and levels of autonomy. It therefore seems probable that women may experience less autonomy than men when working from home as a result of the pandemic. Pre-pandemic, we know that statistically, women were already shouldering a higher proportion of caring responsibilities than men, from unpaid domestic labour, childcare responsibilities to mental load. And the 2016 census found that 27% of Australian women did 15 hours of more work per week of uh, unpaid domestic work versus 8% of Australian men. During the pandemic, the results of the survey by the University of Melbourne suggest that in Australian households with children, parents put in an extra six hours a day of care and supervision, with women taking on more than two thirds of the extra time. And I think we can all have several stories to share about how that was being felt and how we managed that over the past few years, particularly during lockdown. And the data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics gives some further insights into the impact of COVID-19 pandemic had on the households across Australia. And the household impacts of COVID-19 survey, which was conducted in 2021, found that women were more likely than men to have spent on, on unpaid indoor housework, cooking, and the care or supervision of children, with 62% of women spending five or more hours in the week on unpaid indoor housework versus 35% of men, which is that difference of 27%. When 38% of women spend five or more hours in the week on unpaid caring or supervision of children versus 28% of women and 64% of women spent time cooking and baking versus 37% of men. Again, it's perhaps not surprising that women should feel a diminished sense of autonomy over their time compared to men that they would feel less able to benefit from the potential enhanced autonomy afforded by working from home, that this plays out detrimentally in their overall sense of well-being, and that it has been exasperated by the pandemic and additional home life demands, such as the toll of homeschooling and additional childcare that has been found. And importantly, this pattern is occurring regardless of seniority and income. Research by scientists from the universities of uh, Oxford, Zurich, Cambridge, showed that working women in the UK, Germany, and the US are doing more childcare and homeschooling across all wage brackets during the pandemic compared to men with similar earnings. And this is congruent with our findings that the gender gap in wellbeing plays out across both employees and business leaders. 
So when we think about some of this data that's starting to be shared and the predictions that are coming through, what is those future implications of the well-being gender gap? On the one hand, the increased flexibility that is likely to come with hybrid working models is projected to enhance women's well-being. So it's not all bad news, as it helps to relieve the stress of trying to balance work and home. For everyone, if implemented well, hybrid working has the potential to offer enormous advantages of our collective well-being. However, a growing number of experts from Columbia University to the Harvard Business Review, to The Economist, to the Financial Times have expressed concern that hybrid work environments may magnify the gender gap and negatively impact women. And it seems likely that hybrid models will see women occupying less office time than men as they seek to balance their greater share of home and childcare demands. More women, 65% than men at 55%, would prefer the fluidity of an office they could drop into any time. Whereas for men who were interviewed and asked, 32% uh, would prefer to have set days when the whole company has to be in the office each week. So research, research shows it is important for women to be physically present, present in order to be heard than for men, with 45% of female business leaders reported that it's difficult for women to speak up in virtual meetings. And one in five women say she's been overlooked or ignored by colleagues in video calls. If predictions are accurate and there are fewer women in the office in the future, as we start to navigate hybrid working, they're likely to suffer from being outnumbered by men in the office. And stereotypes are easily applied when difference is more noticeable, as we know. And as it is, when one group becomes less common and more another. And so what we're starting to see, or, or what there may be some concerns about when we consider hybrid working environments, is a step back on how we're bringing diversity of in groups and individuals into the workplace and how they are being able to show up and have a seat at the table, in other words. The lack of women may also alienate the female employees who do choose to return to the physical office, which can further exasperate the situation and creating a vicious cycle that makes it more difficult to for women to return and thrive. With seven out of 10 who said they've experienced adverse changes to their daily routines during the pandem pandemic, they believe these shifts have prevented or will now prevent them from progressing. It's really interesting. So there's a lot of data there and there's a lot of uh, information and reports that are coming through. They come in on a weekly basis at this stage. We're doing our best to kind of keep track of that coming through. But what does this all mean in summary? What are we trying to say here when we start to think about future hybrid working environments and how do we consider the well-being of these gender gaps that we might be starting to predict or even see in our workplace? First of all, the reduction in well-being for women and their diminished sense of autonomy may be the result of the increased pressure on them in the home to keep all the balls in the air during the pandemic and coming out of it. A lower level of confidence for women may be the result of the increased risk of imposter syndrome in the pandemic context. And COVID has put women at an overall well-being disadvantage compared to men. While the increased flexibility of hybrid working is important for women's well-being, and I think it's definitely played an advantage in women's well-being, the longer-term fallout of this is likely to constitute male-dominated physical offices, where it is harder for women to get ahead, harder for them to feel heard, and perhaps harder for them to feel they belong. And so now when we have looked at this research and we've considered the predictions that may play out coming out of the pandemic and into hybrid working environments, what do we need to think about and consider as companies, as employers, when we are creating our culture transformation and our workplace strategies? Before I invite Natasha to join me and, and share her insights and on the ground, I want to pause and just uh, and, and ask James, how's the chat going? Has there been any, any comments or any questions that you'd like to share? Thanks, Angela. Uh, we've been looking in the background. No, I think everybody has actually uh, been intently focused in on the stats and the data and is kind of reflecting uh, on what that means uh, and what it means for strategies and what we're seeing in different organizations. So I've I've just popped a note in the chat box, everybody, please feel free to pop questions in. We will stop and try to uh, cover them. Uh, 
Great. Thank you, James. That's brilliant. Well, why don't we get the conversation started? And, and before we then dive into some of the strategies of how we can consider enhancing well-being, particularly for uh, gender gaps, I am delighted to first of all have our guest speaker join me to bring some on, ground, on the ground perspectives and views. Uh, as James kindly introduced, uh, I'd like to invite Natasha Van Wick. She's a manager of training design from BHP based in Perth. So hopefully a little bit warmer than where I am in Sydney at the moment today, Natasha. Um, but Natasha is a learning specialist with many, many years experience and also has been quite heavily involved within BHP and, and across a lot of the initiatives that's happening within that business, both pre-pandemic, but now considering it coming out of the pandemic in the past few years. So welcome. Welcome, Natasha. How are you today? Hi, Angela. So um, thrilled to be here and hi, everyone else again. Um, the research that you've just shared is fascinating um, and it's really quite insightful um, to see, you know, what's happening across the world, across the globe with regards to well-being and even just the differences between males and females. Yeah, no, it is. It is, it is isn't it? Thank you. And it's, it's one of those things where I think we've always, as organisations, as, as employers, really thought about how do we make that um, gender balance like be felt and, and heard going into the workplace. And I think really what this data is about is not to scare us, but just to maybe put us more on alert that our workplace has completely changed. You know, future of work is very different. Uh, and, and for all of us, we're now navigating, well, what should that look like and how do we consider that with some of that data that's coming through? So my first question for you then, Natasha, is, is what are your insights and ob observations on women's well-being? Um, so, for example, what issues have you been seeing in terms of how women might have been struggling during the pandemic in these past few years? Sure. Um, I might actually start with the first part in just well-being in general. And, um, and maybe even just from the context of BHP, we have been quite bold with our ambition around uh, gender um, balance and also diversity targets, which has really shaped a lot of um, some really key strategies and flexible work, whether that's working from home remotely or through different um, ways of working has been a really key enabler for us pre-pandemic. Pre um, I think post-pandemic, that has the fantastic thing about that is it's kind of put everyone in the same bucket. I think before pandemic, it was more around special circumstances and maybe predominantly women looking to take up different types of work arrangements to suit, you know, their needs or their personal situation and um, how we would enable that. I think what we've seen post that is just a broader appreciation for, uh, for flexible work that's not just tied to those in certain cir circumstances. And I think it's also maybe even just given others and predominantly women more freedom to take up some of those um, those options that maybe they might have been a bit reluctant or um, less confident to pursue on their part. Um, and so I think in general, as the stats have kind of shared and you talked to quite well, we've seen a lot of positivity with that as every person's situation is different and um, being able to apply that in their work context and that's their session to, you know, get the best value out of work has been great. Um, what we've seen, however, through the lockdown is that when we don't have choice, it becomes um, extra difficult. And, and coming out of lockdown, I think that was one of the biggest things post-pandemic as we thought about the evolution of, you know, about particularly, you know, working from home strategies is, how do we enable and empower our people to have more choice in this and not kind of go down the line of um, more rigid rules um, and more rigid kind of controls around percentages of where you work? And our principle that we use um, around this is work where you get the best outcomes. So from a company perspective, that really allows individuals and teams to consider how do we actually enable you know, work where you get the best outcomes. So, you know, post-pandemic, I've seen on one side where, you know, a member of my team has been able to, you know, jump in the caravan and work from Margaret River down south as her husband has um, been surfing and she's been able to be super productive 
while she's changed up, you know, her work setting where she can kind of have walks on the beach in the morning and a coffee before she actually gets started to some other colleagues where um, the, 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 the enabling coming into the office to be able to focus and kind of get the work done and really feel empowered to do that has been, you know, a strategy for them. So I think that's some of the pluses around this. I think some of the, in some of the struggles maybe that I've seen, um, specifically from my context of work. So, I mean, BHP is massive, um, but I think my context is more around, you know, my, my team, some of my peers, maybe some of my, my family and friends that are females with young families. It, I definitely observe some of that greater pressures about balance. How do we balance that home life and work life in a way that makes sense and maybe that more blurred lines of work and home has played out in more stress and more um, pressure. Mm. I think in general, I have absolutely observed some of the stats that you shared where we've seen post-pandemic less females are actually choosing to come into the office, you know, in the context of our work where you get the best outcomes and a lot more male colleagues are actually coming to the office more frequently. And I think on reflection on that and also, you know, talking and understanding my team, it's really about that balance of, I'm spending extra time traveling. I'm having to coordinate more things at home. And so how do I balance actually getting into the office in certain time frames so I can feel like I'm adding value and, and, and doing the right things? It's quicker to get some things done at home if I was working from home versus if I'm in the office and having to, you know, juggle a little bit more. Um, and so, yeah, that's some of the things that we, I mean, clearly seeing or I have actually witnessed that really correlates quite well to some of the stats that you've shared. Yeah, no, fantastic. And I think definitely what you've just shared there as well is, you know, the idea of where that flexibility or increased flexibility of being able to work from home, there maybe is that underlining pressure, particularly for females about, you know, having to always be on. Uh, and I think that that might play a bit into the behaviours of how females think and how they work and how they uh, want to be perceived uh, in the workplace. And, and that might also encourage as employers for us to go, well, how do we help bring, you know, routines and rituals to help those flexible environments not have that um, you know that that um, not need to be on all the time for females and have that right balance mm -hmm. and shift between the two um I do that's love that where, where you get the best outcomes Natasha that's such a great great um phrase uh that you've that you, your, your business has come yeah. out with love that <laughs> Um, when we look at the terms of projections around the gender gap, potentially becoming greater in hybrid future. So when we look at hybrid future, it's that flexibility of coming in office, working from home. What are your insights and observations on this as a concern? It's, yeah, that's a really good question. I think for me personally, I probably don't have specific um, insights on, you know, that gap, that gender gap, and particularly around, you know, how that is different in the hybrid way of working. But definitely from a BHP standpoint, uh, we are still very committed to our targets and our ambition around, you know, gender balance. And we have actually made a lot of progress in that space and learned a lot along the way too. And so that's still part of um, our strategies and still a really big thing that we 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 having to target. Um, I think it's also more broadly for us too, as we think about the different challenges that our types of work presents with, you know, how much we able to ensure that um, we provide the right work arrangements um, for for females, because, you know, some of the real challenges around particularly knowing that there's a higher um, responsibility maybe on females in balancing some of that home life, particularly if there's family and kids involved. And we've got, you know, work setups where there's rosters or maybe being away from work um, and, you know, that sort of thing. So that's kind of a constant challenge in how we enable that. How do we, you know, make that fair and um, empower our females to help kind of bring that choice into those rosters where we can work together to, to have the right setups. But I think, I think for me, the observations really is just that tension between meaningful work and career progression um, that seems to be, and the family children kind of dynamic about how we balance that. And, and that seems to be a bigger um, tension with our female colleagues versus, you know, some of our male colleagues. 
Yes, great. Uh, good, good perspectives there. And I can imagine uh, context that will continue to evolve and unravel and, and discover internally for your company as you keep navigating out of the pandemic and all the regions that you operate, because you're not just Australian based. So you're also navigating Same. different regions and different environments yeah. that the pandemic will be going through. And different stages of a post-pandemic uh, progression, I think, is what we're kind of playing out. And so it's, it's it's a really interesting dynamic for us to think about, you know, what principles do we set at an enterprise, at a company kind of level wide? How, would it, how do we create the right frames? And then, you know, how do we allow different businesses and countries to be able to operate within their context that helps us all achieve that together? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. So when we think about, uh, you know, mitigating some of those challenges and providing that support on well-being, and whether that's gender specific, Natasha, or it might be more um, generalized across BHP to support inclusive environments that you're trying to get, what has your organization been doing? What are you starting to think about? Uh, what are you able to share with, with all of us today on what you're starting to consider around supporting well-being? Sure. Um, I mean, this is really a passionate space of mine too. And like I shared, we've been on this journey for a while. So there's a lot of things that we've actually learned about just the differences between our genders that we have been trying to adjust our processes and our ways of thinking so that we can remove maybe even some of the bias that we've recognized exists. But some of the small things um, that probably just talks to uh, that imposter syndrome or, or some of those other challenges that maybe females might have as they're balancing you know, a different dynamic of, of work. And I just want to also call out, I know I'm talking in general, it's not always just that females are balancing this, but just in general, in general terms, some of the simple things we do with, say, for meetings, as an example, um, we've adopted a standard way of practice where all meetings, we will include um, a virtual connection um, like WebEx, we use WebEx as the tool for us to connect virtually. Mm -hmm. And something simple like that takes off some of the pressure around, do I have to physically be in that space or in that meeting, you know, to be able to feel like I'm heard or feel like I'm, I'm contributing. And so even if it ends up being, you know, that we all are in person, by adding, you know, WebEx invites to all meetings, we subconsciously are uh, giving people the option and, and the freedom of choice. You know, we talked about where, work where you be, get the best outcomes and how do we enable people that have different ways of working to actually choose to be, well, I want to work from home and this makes sense for me, but I don't want that to be the um, expense of me being able to contribute and add value and be a part of the team. So something small like that has actually been quite a big game changer for us where we can be really intentional about this is a specific thing that we all need to be in the office for. How do we plan towards that versus everything else? We actually all can connect in and contribute in a way that makes sense. So that's just some, a, a really simple, um, small thing. We've also got some tools that helps to share some visibility around are we working remotely or are we working in the office that also helps to um, create more awareness and more transparency um, and enable that choice a little bit better where those that might feel like they need more flexible arrangements in their situation aren't feeling the guilt that might subconsciously come with that if they're in a team that um, don't have any pressures around coordinating time and coordinating where they need to be. Some of the more bigger things that we're doing um, organizational-wide, which is really, really exciting. I just want to kind of call out a couple of things um, that I think is going to, ha that's helping us push forward um, to that ambition and also maybe addressing some of the, the, the data that you shared today is um, we've been doing a lot of, we've had this really big transformational um, activity that has several pillars of, of work that our organization is going through and have been over the last two years or so. And one of the aspects of that is really looking at purpose. And we've done both top down and also bottom up in making it really pl plain and simple and clear around not so much what we do, but why do we do it? What's the value story behind that? And I call this out because I think it's really, really important that as we've learned around our workforce and our people feeling connected to their team purpose and being really clear on 
the value story and how their work actually connects up into each of the other teams and their purposes. It's really helped us all as a kind of organization, but definitely at an individual perspective to create more meaning and engagement and connection to mm. the work and in the teams. And I think that's really some of the centers around this well-being. It's not everything, but, you know, it's part of it. And that's had a huge shift, I think, and continuing to have a huge shift in, in us connecting and, and, and seeing how the things that we do matters. And I feel a part of a greater good. Um, and it's really also some of the broader transformation work is centered around um, empowering our workforce to be problem solvers. This is the biggest challenge for us that the only way that we can really enable um, better well-being and, and enable our diversity um, agenda and also our inclusion agenda is allowing everyone to share what the world looks like from their perspective and creating the right ecosystem and system around that so that we can remove barriers and really collectively solve some of those problems that actually helps us make a huge difference. So I think for that in particular, it's been, um, I think that's been positive changes and, and hard work, but positive work to help us kind of get there. And then more broadly, we've done several things around culture and really being purposeful and intentional about, you know, how are we addressing some of the culture? And from one side, it's just about broadening safety and thinking about psychological safety. And how does this actually show up in our teams? How are we, um, where are we at in helping create the right environment so people can share if they're feeling stressed or share if they are not coping or share if they need help? And I think that's part of the things that is difficult when you're not physically present. Mm -hmm. where you get to see some of these, these these signs. And so by us focusing on, on that and really helping our leaders and helping our teams um, create more awareness and practice this in the teams in which they're operating, I think we're starting to see a lot more um, flexibility and a lot more openness and a lot, of more, a lot more discussions about how we can actually help and support one another. Yeah, I love, I love everything that you've said about that and, and particularly tapping into what I see is kind of seizing an opportunity when you're starting to think about how do you help employees navigate purpose and connecting that to the purpose of the business. You know, we've kind of come out of these last two years where we've got really personal with each other. You know, we're literally dialing in from each other's homes. We've met all each other's pets, our yeah. kids, um, sometimes our partners who, you know, interrupt a call without intentions. And I think that's created a very big shift psychologically in that connection piece. And then how do we start to think about that coming back into the roles that employees play? So I really love how BHP and, and your teams are thinking about that and culture transformation moving forward. So thanks for yeah. sharing. Yeah. There's actually just one other thing that I thought about, which I think has also been important. We've had all of our leaders demonstrate that that's okay um, by turning on their videos and it's okay that my world is being shared. I don't have to live in or kind of separate work and, and, and home in that, in that sense. And I think that's created a lot of freedom that mm -hmm. I don't have to feel embarrassed although it is awkward when you know the kids kind of run up in screen I'm not going to be judged by that and when we see that being role modeled through some of our senior leaders and that's embraced and it's encouraged it's helped to create more of that freedom um, and you know release maybe some of that that stress or that guilt that we might feel as women yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, I love it. Thank you. Natasha, great insights. And, and my final question for you is a bit more of a personal one. Um, it's about uh, about you and, and your own well-being as, as a woman in the workplace and navigating these last few, few years. Uh, I'd love you to share, if you have any, any personal strategies or advice uh, that you can share that you found worked really well for yourself. Um, sure, that's a great question. Uh, I think for me, it's important for me to know what are the things that energize me and what are the things that um, deplete my, my energy sources or start to kind of get into my, my, my stresses. And I love my job and I love the reach and remit of the work that I, that I have and I have a great team. Um, and there's many elements of my work that actually creates 
and energizes me. But there is also a lot of responsibility and stress and expectations that that go with that. And so maybe the first thing that I would say is just around me and my time and particularly in times where there's stressful projects or really, you know, complex work that is affecting the way I'm thinking. I try to balance up my time and my personal time with some of the more the things that energize me. I love kind of spending time with my family and friends and I love watching cheesy rom-coms or light-hearted shows on Netflix or just being out in nature and changing up my scenery a little bit to get a bit of balance in the times you know, that I'm not working to be really intentional about using that times to um, do things that's going to help restore some of my energy, help give me more a sense of um, balance and um, different perspective in the work. Um, I think another thing for me also is, and it probably get a bit of a mindset is around expectation. Mm-hmm. I often have to stop and think, Is this my own expectation that I'm putting on myself when it comes to this work Um, or is it perceived or real and really stopping and saying, you know, where's that kind of coming from? Can I just think about things a little bit differently and, you know, release maybe some of this expectations that I'm putting on myself because I find that there is a lot of internal pressure that I put on myself to deliver and do things that actually is generated from myself that others may not even be aware of. And so just kind of having some of those checks inside and even just around the quality of work, sometimes things don't have to be a hundred percent perfect. We are working in a time now where we can't just connect with people in person and solve things, you know, straight away to what we were before where, you know, you kind of just pop your head over the divider and look at someone that might be sitting next to you. And so with that comes, you know, as I work remotely and I love it, it also is challenging when you're solving for things on your own. And so really being clear about, you know, can I reduce the quality somewhat? Can I kind of bring in someone early to help, you know, share the stress and the load? And I found that that's been something, again, that I remind myself of. And when I do it, I feel so much better because I I then have been carrying some things maybe longer than what what I should have. And maybe the last thing is just about, um, actually maybe two. One other thing is just about maintaining active work relationships. I've really found that to the example that I shared before, it's so easy when everyone's working in the same location and everyone's there every day that you really feel connected and you're building those relationships with your work colleagues in an organic way. I've got to be really more intentional with um, with my relationships and and how I build that in this hybrid way of working. And so I often have just no agenda, virtual catch catch ups with some stakeholders, particularly ones that I'm not connecting in with my immediate work group, just to feel connected, to kind of maintain that sense of um, network. And that has to be more intentional these days. And then lastly, just to be kind, I think there's a lot of things that we carry that maybe we don't need to carry. And sometimes life is challenging. And so just to be kind on yourself. Yeah, I love it. Thanks, Natasha. Those were a great list of tips there. Um, absolutely. And I, I concur with a lot of what you've said and it kind of supports back on what we were sharing with the data, you know, that giving giving the balance that, that you need in those flexi environments, not always the pressure of being on, like how do you recharge yourself with the things that you love to do? Um, love it. All really amazing things and really appreciate your share and, and your contributions today. Um, you. Before we move on to the wrap up, James, is there any particular particular questions come through from anyone um, either for Natasha or myself or any comments that you'd like to share or you're on mute James (laughs) typical uh typical zoom teams uh traits two and a half years in we are all still doing that apparently um, thanks, Anja. The chat box has been fairly quiet, I think, because everybody's just uh, like me, engaged and interested in um, your perspectives, Natasha. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, um, comment from Janelle about the, the modeling that you talked about, Natasha, being so important. Um, and a comment from Hannah around mm-hmm. yet agreeing with this idea of being really more deliberate about connections. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and Hannah's saying she hasn't, hasn't worked in the same office as her team for about 12 years now. Wow. Um, yeah. Hannah, is that is that correct? 12, so 10 years pre-COVID, you've been uh, yeah. a pioneer 
in virtual <laughs> first working? Well, look, I, I work for um, a federal government agency, so we um, we are quite geographically spread and been fortunate to work in teams that probably traditionally should have sat in Canberra. Um, but we, uh, yeah, in the teams I've worked in, I, yeah, there's some team members I've actually never met face to face in some of the teams that um, mm. I've worked in. So um, for me, the conversations around this sort of hybrid working environment or this, you know, um, I guess, ongoing discussions about needing to be in the office with people in order to connect to me is a really foreign thought you know and uh, and like I said in my chat it, the teams I've worked in have been highly functioning and highly connected mm -hmm. and um and really awesome to work in so uh, and I'm also I'm, you know all that a lot of that time I've I'm been full-time working I'm I'm a working mother although my girls are now left home they're older and you know adults and all that kind of stuff so you know I, I understand some of the challenges around that balance but um yeah I yeah I just couldn't agree uh, more with you Natasha just about you know you need to still do those water cooler conversations but they're not as you walk past each other it's like hey I'm just going to give you a call you know because that's the relationship building that's the connections um mm. that, that you make so sorry I've talked too much no, that's no, great. No, no. Not, not <laughs> at all, you, Hannah. Um, Hannah. Fantastic to hear from such an expert. I feel like we need to get you as a uh, as a poster child more for positive <laughs> uh, positive hybrid working. Thank you so much for sharing. Yes, thank you. Thanks, James. Thanks, uh, thanks, Hannah, for sharing those insights. Absolutely great to hear that you're uh, you're you have been navigating this for many years, but also it might be refreshing for you to also hear the people who haven't kind of how they're starting to feel. So there might be some really great uh, kind of combined strategies coming in together. Natasha, I want to thank you on behalf of myself and the team at DBL. Your insights are always valuable and you've shared some really amazing um, ideas and concepts around what you're thinking as a business, but also for yourself individually. So thank you for your time today. Thank you for the invite. It's been wonderful to be here and to hear about the research, talk more about this topic and also be um, given an opportunity to share some of my thoughts. So thank you. You're more than welcome. Thanks, Natasha. And look, with that, we've got a few minutes left on the hour. And, and like we do at DBR, we never want to leave people hanging <laughs> with all this data we shared and then we don't leave you with anything to take away with. We absolutely have some ideas and thoughts around strategies. Not only has Natasha shared some concepts from on the ground, like what, what's happening inside um, an organization's perspective, but also how do we think about mitigating while being gender gap? And the good news is, is that our research shows that the correlation between supporting wellbeing and capability, confidence, adaptability and organizational belonging and motivation and performance. You can read all about this detail in our white paper uh, that, as I said, is free to download from our website if you haven't done so already. Um, and just for now, what I'll do is just been a couple of minutes to outline some of the benefits uh, when we start to think about the strategies to support well-being, uh, which is really important for us to do that. So for um, while for those who are outlines when we think about our um, well-being and calm, our behavioural science team actually conducted uh, a rigorous literal review and meta-analysis to inform what we call now CALM. And this is our evidence-based actionable model. It's created to help employers navigate well-being challenges in the hybrid uh, future of work to mitigate the well-being gap and to support their own and their people's long-term belonging. And so what we talk about in CALM is amply named the tenets of confidence, adaptability, links and motivation. And when we start to dive into that, we talk about how do we think about what capabilities and how do we help our employees with the skills that really support their own well-being coming into it. So for example, when we look at building confidence, we can look at the confidence being not a fixed attribute and it can be developed. How do we think about it and how do we support females to develop their confidence in two ways? How do we help them to learn and understand the tricks to becoming more confident overall, um, empowering them to embrace life with more courage and with more confidence and to reap those rewards both professionally and personally, but also how do we support females to feel confident in specific areas where they lack confidence? And these are some of the skills that our behavioral science team have mapped out from the data that will help employees um, in needing more confidence currently in the workplace. 
When we look at adaptability, we look at skills like adaptable mindset and resilience. How do we support females to cultivate an adaptable mindset to help them work flexibly and to adapt to those ever-changing landscape environments that we've been navigating for quite some time? The level of resilience required for sustained periods or periods also evolved to grit and building the skill of grit. So what we're seeing a lot now as companies are going, actually, we've got great resilience in our employees, but what we need to help them with now is grit and how they continue the longevity of that coming through. And then, of course, when we think about these skills, we also think about how do we equip the leaders, the managers to support their teams in having adaptability coming through on that. When we look at links, we look at how do we empower uh, females to build links and connections. And Tasha, you touched on that really nicely with your own personal experience. And how do you promote belonging? And we're now starting to see specific skills being developed to help employees really understand how they own their own belonging and how they help promote others' belongings and become culture champions of their organization and how they're starting to think about that. And then, of course, finally, we look at the motivation, the, the tenant of M and the calm, which is around empowering uh, females to build links and connections. Um, I'm sorry, um, motivation, which is to support females to galvanize that sense of purpose, um, scaffolding that motivation with passion. How do we help them with enhancing performance when it comes to self-management? And then, of course, how do we help managers if they're supporting hybrid teams in supporting well-being and helping to energize and support teams of inclusive teams? And how do we motivate others through that? So these are all skills that have now been developed, are being developed and being rolled out. Out, um, with clients out there. Also great for you to have a, an idea and a sense of, well, what could that look like back in your own programs and in your own um, transformation strategies? This is all going to be available following the session. And I wanted to take this opportunity to also introduce my colleague, Matthew Steen. He's been on this call the whole time. He's our senior consultant. Uh, he'll make sure he'll reach out following this, give you um, access to the slides, the data, and anything else that's been shared here if you would require that. With that, we're now right on time. I want to take this opportunity to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you again, Natasha, for your contribution and share. And we look forward to being in touch with you all soon. And until then, take care and look after yourself. Thank you.